Go for it. Okay. Hello. Um, hello. Hello. SJS Summer Meeting 2017 and hello Facebook Live. So this is an experiment. We are streaming uh, with Facebook Live. We've never live streamed a number of meetings before and we'll see how it works out. But Facebook family, we're excited that you're there. Um, so uh, what we're about to do right now, I'm really, really excited for you all to meet these uh, amazing organizers and to hear their stories um, of what they've been able to accomplish with the Giving Project model. So as most of you know, um, Social Justice Fund has been around a long time. We're heading up on our 40th anniversary next year. Um, and we've always been a membership organization and we've always funded grassroots social justice organizing. And we've always done that through a combination of um, fundraising and uh, uh, democratic grant making. But in 2010, um, we took a big leap. Um, I say we, but I wasn't on staff that made this decision, or the board that made this decision. Um, the organization decided to take a big flying leap into the unknown um, with a new model that we call Giving Projects um, that would bring together multiracial, cross class group of volunteers to do the whole enchilada of political education, meaningful giving grassroots fundraising, and democratic parent making. Um, and a lot of people thought this was a terrible idea, um, including some of the people who went for it. They said, ah, this sounds like a terrible idea, but we gotta do something, right? Um, and some people thought it was a genius, brilliant idea, and turns out they were right. Um, because uh, here we are, seven years later, um, not only has Social Justice Fund experienced an incredible transformation, you just heard the numbers of um, how much we're, we're raising and granting out now, um, not only has this uh, rejuvenated and enriched our organization and our movement in the Northwest in so many ways, but it's actually spread around the country. So there are now five other funds um, who are doing this model, calling it giving projects and doing it um, with, with the same ingredients um, that, that you are familiar with through SJS. Um, uh, for, you know, as, as we said in the, in the, um, uh, the outreach for this event, you know, we're assuming a familiar, familiarity with the Giving Project model, right? So if you don't know what I'm talking about, please, please talk to a staff person or, uh, or a board member or a member very soon. But right now, we're going to dive into it and find out what it looks like um, when this model spreads, when it's replicated, when it's adapted to different communities and different geographies. Um, I uh, have been, it's been so powerful to me personally as somebody who helped create this model in Seattle to see um, how strong it is. You know, it was a little bit easy, for me it was a little bit easy to sort of minimize our success in a way. Um, to feel like, well yeah, we're doing really well, it's working really well for us, we've been successful, um, but you know, maybe it's just a fluke, or maybe it's just, uh, you know, it's just the, the, the combination of the time and the place and whatever. Um, and it wasn't until I saw what was happening around the country that I understood, wow, we actually created something, and by we, I know I don't mean we the staff of SJF, I mean all of you and all of these guys, um, we created something that works and has real potential to change philanthropy as we know it. Um, so the, the funds that are doing this are Red and Rose's Community Fund in Philadelphia. Woo! Yes! Yeah. <laughs> Chinook Fund in Colorado. Is Chinook in the house yet? No. Uh, Crossroads Fund in Chicago. <laughs> Headwaters Foundation for Justice in Minnesota. <laughs> and North Star Fund in New York. Yay! And the reason they're all here is because we get together once a year. This is our third annual convening, and this year we're hosting it here in uh, Seattle. And so that's why I asked um, these guys, even though we have five months, these three are going to come up here and share our stories um, and tell us what it looks like, um, what it's been like for them to do giving projects in their community. So I'll go ahead and ask, actually, just ask each of you to introduce yourselves, introduce your foundations, and, um, and tell us your. your just like the top line, how many giving projects are you doing? How long have you been doing them? And then we'll get into more detail on that. Sure. So I'm David Nicholson. I'm uh, with Headwaters Foundation for Justice. So we're located in Minneapolis and we fund statewide throughout the state. We do one giving project a year now. Uh, we've been doing it for three years. And I'll tell a little more about it. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm so excited to be here. I've, for long before I ever knew Crossroads, I knew people who had done giving projects in Seattle and always had a resource mobilization crush on those folks. So <laughs> it's just an honor to be here in person with you all. Um, and I am representing Crossroads Fund, which um, is located in Chicago, and we fund in and around the city of Chicago. 
Um, and we have also run one giving project a year for the past three years. Hi everyone, I'm Arthi, and it's 11 o'clock in Philadelphia. So <laughs> you see me yawning, please don't be mad. Um, we are from Red Roses Community Fund. We do fund in the Philadelphia and surrounding counties, including Camden County in New Jersey. Um, and we have done, we did one giving project in 2016, we're doing two in 2017, and we plan to do three in 2018. So we're doing a slow ramp. Maybe it's a faster. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. So I told these guys, don't prepare a presentation or anything like that. If, if we do have a table in front of us, but really I want this to be a casual conversation. I really want to encourage you all to ask questions. So. We're just gonna kind of get the conversation started, but I really do want this to be a conversation between all of us. Um, so if you wanna just kind of uh, start out with uh, sharing um, what led you to try out this idea, um, you know, what was what was the road to, to trying it out, and what has it, what, is, what has it done for your organization? Sure. Well, um, so I've been with Headwaters Foundation for 14 years now, and for the first 10 years, you know, as Mijo was talking about, we were a traditional social justice foundation doing community-led grant making. And about four years ago, when I became the executive director, one of the things I wanted to do was to move more money, to engage more donors, and really looked at what are the models about revitalizing social justice philanthropy in uh, the country and early in the world, and, land, and landed really on this model. We actually brought Zeke out um, to come and do some learning and sharing where we all got together and asked a lot of really hard questions. And then we really said, this is really the model for us. And from there, we really reshaped our foundation really to take this on as one piece of our grant making. We do five grant rounds a year. This is one of the ones we do, but it's the really the central part of how we're revitalizing our foundation. And it's been dramatic and it's led to both amazing successes for us as an organization, you know, increasing our grant making, increasing our donor base. But the thing for me, it's been both personally transformative for the individuals. People talked about, or people asked a question earlier about why is there only 25 people? Why is the number capped? And part of it for me is I've been watching this uh, both with Social Justice Fund, but then also in, in our shop, this is really about transforming people. It's about people really finding in themselves their own personal commitment, working through their journey around money and connecting to themselves to the community. And that's an intimate experience that really serves best in a smaller venue. So we really took that to heart, um, have modeled it really, and we've been deeply appreciative of all of you for creating this model and then sharing it with us. And that's kind of where we've been going with it. I was thinking that, you know, being with the cadre of Social Justice Foundation, some of the answers are similar. Um, but uh, Crossroads has also been around for 35 years and has had a legacy of community grant making and activist led grant making that entire time. And um, Crossroads was growing and thriving um, when we first learned about the Giving Project model. Like David, we also have um, a variety of funds and programs that we've run throughout the years. So we have a youth fund for social change that um, has a committee of youth organizers and activists who decide where the grants go. Um, we run a number of capacity building programs. We fund groups of budgets of $300,000 and less, and so we um, help do like tailored capacity building if organizations want to grow their budget size. We have a woman of color leadership program. Um, so we had a wide variety of programs, and we had people who understood the work of Crossroads, but since We've been around for 35 years. A lot of the people who really understood the work deeply were founders, and the founders are getting older and older, and really um, had deep connections to grantees. But see, I see, and I think Crossroads sees like the potential of social justice foundations as this amazing mechanism that can get money, like pool and redistribute resources to folks who are directly doing the work that we all benefit from and that is so needed in our society. And this just felt like an amazing way to bring more people into that process. Um, and in a city like Chicago, uh, we fund 90 groups throughout the year. Um, there are people who are doing the work in their community who may be two hours away from the folks who are fighting for public housing on the far south side and um, might be in the world and really connected to people who are doing public housing organizing 
but might not know the folks who are fighting for environmental justice in the near west suburbs or um, or, or and that can like through the giving project start to see those connections between that work and build really different coalitions that can be really powerful in um, moving the powers that be in Chicago, which are formidable but very beautiful too. Um, so I think we just were so excited to think about how can we bring in a new generation of folks who are deeply connected to this work? How can we return to a legacy of having conversations on race and class and organizing and building connections for folks to those conversations? And then to have this action component of like, we're moving beyond talk to be able to um, move money like and do work together and be connected to the grantees that are doing this work around the city. So. I know you all know a lot about that as well, but it was what made us feel so excited about the model and have really seen those returns in the work in the past three years. Um, yes, yeah, so similarly, Red and Roses Community Fund, we have been around for 40 years. This is our 40th anniversary in 2017. And uh, but we actually began as the People's Fund in 1971. Um, which was a membership organization, which was a group of young people raising money and doing fundraising and coming together to make decisions. Um, in the last few years, in around 2012, with the leadership of our executive director, we did a major visioning process. And the core question that was put to our community uh, was, should Red and Roses still exist? Are we taking up resources that should be used by, you know, grassroots community organizations? Um, and we spent two years doing that. Six hundred people participated, and the resounding answer was yes. You should exist, but you need to move more money. And so we've been trying to figure out how to do that. Um, and so uh, Casey, our executive director, had the opportunity to. Uh, as uh, David mentioned, go to Minneapolis and hear from Zeke, learn about the model, and was just immediately struck that this could be the answer um, that we were looking for. And uh, I came on board soon after that. Um, the year before we did giving projects, we were making about $65,000 in grants um, on average to groups. Our first giving project, we made $189,000. So that tripled our grant making right off the bat, right? So we moved more money. And for us, that's the bottom line. I think as Nijo so elegantly put it earlier, there is always that balance between the moving the money and the other kind of stuff we could be doing. Um, but for us, that moving the money is the charge that we've been given most loudly. And so we really are um, committed to that. And that is why we decided to ramp up from one to two to three. I just realized we have two mics on the table, so. <laughs> I don't know if share this one, you guys can share that one. Um, <laughs> no, 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 I didn't, I didn't know either. We were just talking about it. Um, so I'm wondering if any of you have a story of a time when you saw, or when somebody else in your organization saw, um, when it kind of clicked, like, oh, now I get it. Now I get why this model works. Um, there was somebody who was skeptical, who was one over, or maybe there's somebody with you. Um, but but a, a story of a, of a time when you understood what the Given Project could do. Hello. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I have actually two that come to mind. Um, and we've only done two Giving Projects at this point, so I'll tell you one from each Giving Project. The first one was from our first Giving Project, we had a uh, a young white woman um, who was uh, from a family with wealth, and um, she herself, uh, her personally meaningful gift uh, was $5,000, um, and she reported that she had talked to her father about doing this, she wanted to do this, and his first reaction was, you're being irresponsible and frivolous with our money. And, um, you know, she was really discouraged, but she, persisted, she had conversation after conversation, and by the end of the project, he matched her gift. And to me, that was really uh, a great example of the power of the model, both in moving more money and in, 
creating that context for those conversations. As we say, you know, as you all know, it's the conversations that are part of the magic of the Giving Project and are, are equally important to the money that's being made. So that, that's one. The second one, I would say, is uh, in our most recent Giving Project, uh, we have a, a person who's a, a grantee. She's a black woman who uh, is awesome and very outspoken. And um, during the race class training, during the cross-class Q&A, she asked one of the um, folks who was in the high income wealth group uh, in the cross class clusters, um, did your family ever own slaves? And the room just kind of went silent and then there was just a really beautiful discussion about that. And I really feel that I, I have seen very few places where that conversation could have happened. And I've been doing anti-racism training for 20 years now. And, um, and it's because of that intentional mix of race and class that I think really creates the dynamic that holds people with wealth accountable to really digging deep. And people of color to speaking truth in those spaces. And I think that was something that clicked for me in that. In that sure, I got a story. Um, so first I want to introduce a couple of people. Allison, wave, raise your hand, and Maria. So these are uh, two staff from Headwaters. Yeah. And so if you want the amazing stories of participants, of people that, are, that, are, um, that have been transformed through the Giving Project, go to them. Because I actually don't, uh, I don't have the privilege of actually running a Giving Project. But one of the things that I'll talk about is really how transformative, how transformative this was in our organization. So similarly, we had a, a fair amount of, um, every time you have change, you have a little bit of anxiety. And so bringing the Giving Project as a new model created a, a little bit of angst, I would say, for some folks. And really, just to kind of put it bluntly, there was a question of, are we asking too much of people of color to raise money? And if we're bringing people in, um, in our grant-making model that have access to wealth, how will that change, taint, uh, affect our, our grant making? And that was really what people were struggling with. It was value questions. It was like really the value of Headwaters rests in a model that people knew, and now you're changing the model and how will that affect it? So for me, um, that was, you know, I was really proud of really the group to be able to identify that, to name it. To me, as the conversations we've been having um, bringing this here, I saw this as really just an extension of that. And we as an organization really, really wrestled with that. And one of the things I was really the most proud of, and this is the kind of the transformative moment, oftentimes when you're in these situations, you don't really know how they're gonna work out. Um, but uh, we had, a, we had a, an unfortunate situation a few years ago where uh, Jamar Clark, uh, an individual, was shot and killed by the police. And um, our activist community rallied and decided to occupy the police, police, the police precinct. And they really came to us and said, can you help? And so we went to our philanthropic community and said, you know, Headwaters wants to, wants to help these activists support their occupation of this. And the philanthropic community really said, that's politically too scary, we can't. And they really just turned their backs on us. But what, what changed and what changed for the organization was when we reached out to the members the, not to our members, to our donors, we don't have a membership model, the people that actually had been through the Giving Project, who had this opportunity to think about race and class, who had been donors for Edwards, they resoundedly just came with their support. Within, what was it, five weeks, six weeks, we raised $150,000 to support that occupation. And that, to me, that level of engagement with that many people was the transformative moment of like, okay, this is what, this is what the Giving Project does. It allows a portal for a lot of people to get very deeply engaged and ready to talk about issues and ready to move and raise money from their own. So, that would be my, I guess you might be the first one. I'm not going to write the same one. Yeah, I, when I think about specific stories from the Giving Project, I, I'm with RT2 come to mind. Um, one is a woman who was part of our second Giving Project. 
who was part of the philanthropic community in Chicago and was connected to social justice work, but I, I, I don't know if she would have said that she had deep um, connections to grantees. But I think she came in with an understanding of like, I'm interested in learning about a couple of groups or a couple of different issue areas. Um, and during the grant making training, she read the proposal that was submitted by Black and Pink, which is an amazing organization that does work with LGBT um, people who are currently incarcerated and people who are formerly incarcerated to do advocacy and organizing work around um, mass incarceration, currently working to end use of solitary confinement in the state of Illinois. And I just remember her coming to me and being like, I, I work around mass incarceration. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> that's what I started <laughs> uh, um, But I just remember her coming to me and be like, I would never have ever wanted to site visit that group. But now that I have read this proposal, I am so interested in visiting them. And it's called into question all the things that I thought I was looking for in grantees that I was interested in visiting. So now I've checked every single applicant uh, as interested. So please send me to as many site visits as possible. <laughs> and we, one of the changes to our, the way that we've modified the model is we fund um, almost 50 groups through the cycle that the Giving Project is a part of. So the Giving Project raises money, Crossroads matches that, or more than matches it. Um, and then we give grants of a variety of sizes, anywhere from $3,000 to $10,000. Um, so she didn't end up going on all 45 site visits that year. But it, I just think it was amazing to think about like what are the depth of learning what different forms of organizing that come from that. Um, and then this year, we had a participant who was actually the best friend of one of our founders of Crossroads Fund, Jean Hardesty, um, who had been connected to the fund in the very beginning uh, and then had not been connected and came back through the Giving Project process and um, was like, extremely nervous about the idea of fundraising. She's like, everyone I know is already giving to Crossroads. I mean, she's very deliberate about like, I guess I'll ask, but I'm not sure if it'll result in anything. Um, and ended up having all of these amazing conversations with folks who had maybe known about Crossroads 30 years ago, but hadn't been aware of the ways that the organization has been growing and changing. I think so many people, especially this year, are searching for a way to be involved in this work and don't always think of giving or moving resources as a key way to support people who are showing up at airports or doing the work on the front lines. Um, and I don't know what's normal for a giving project here in Seattle, but um, we've just seen the amount of donors that our giving projects have fundraised from dramatically increase every year. The first year, they fundraised from 34 individuals. This year, the Giving Project cohort of 18 fundraised from 252 individuals. Um, and it was just amazing to see. And that person like had the most gifts of anyone and was able to move a huge amount of resources in particular. I think it was not only a way to feel useful in this political moment to get reconnected to organizing work, and also to like honor this dear human who was instrumental in like laying the groundwork for what exists today. So uh, that was a really amazing part of this year. Thank you so much for the story. That was uh, we're intentionally doing that. It's gonna make the play. Oh, okay. All right. Um, I will say at the end, uh, I want to put that back up because I have contact info for all five of the funds, so that if you have friends in any of these cities, you know how to put them in touch. So, I want to get that at Um Thank you so much for sharing those stories. Uh, and this place on our stories, you know, because when I think about what is this is a conversation that we. have grappled with a lot at SJF, and in fact, we had a whole giving project called the Movement Building Giving Project, where we asked a whole bunch of smart people, what is a movement? There was very little consensus, but here are some things that I know. Um, it's about bringing in, it's about numbers, right? You, it's partly about bringing in lots of people, um, lots of people with different you know, uh, experiences and diversity of perspectives, but you've got to have numbers, and that's, that's something with the, that you all touched on. It's about but it's also about the interaction between those people having real conversations, having real relationships, right? That it's not transactional, but that it goes deep. Um, and then it's about moving to action, um, and which is something that you all touched on. And so it, you know, it's amazing to me to realize that it's not just this, it's not just social justice fund, but now we are part of this movement um, of giving projects through all these other funds. And I had a moment last year, at last year's convening, and I can't remember who it was, but somebody said to me, "Thank you so much to Social Justice Fund." for all the mistakes that you made. <laughs> because now we don't have to. And I was just like, oh my god, I felt like a one-ton weight got lifted off my shoulders that I didn't even know was there. Because of course we made so many mistakes. And those of you who were in the early giving projects, or maybe the more recent ones, I don't know, uh, but probably not, uh, 
know that we were making it up as we went. And, um, and, uh, and all of you who were part of that experiment and collaborating with us and figuring that out as we went, um, you should know that that is paying off and paying off around the country. So my next question uh, for any or all of you is what are some of the changes that you made to the model? Because you've all put your own tweaks on it um, and, and some really uh, innovative improvements. Um, don't want to get too in the weeds. Not everybody who's here or watching has done a giving project, so they won't necessarily know all the technical stuff that you might talk about. Um, but just some kind of high level changes that you've done. Sure, I'll just be really high level. So there's one, one change that we did, we were very intentional about um, how many giving projects? So we do, like I said, we tried last year, we did two giving projects thinking that, yeah, they're six months long. Well, there's actually longer than that as Yasmin talked about the importance of the overlap. And so we, we were very intentional about doing one a year. And the other piece that we've been, I think, that we learned from you all is there's a tremendous amount of um, connections and relationships that are built with the participants and then with their donors. And so we really thought about how we could take advantage of those relationships and a way to build their connections to Headwaters as donors and, and supporters of the movement. So that's where we've spent, um, I would say, a lot of intentionality, um, which I don't know if it's different than the model, it's just that that's an emphasis that we really want to spend time on. Um, another, another change that we made, um, I, I think, uh, well, I just mentioned what I think is the biggest change is that um, we, we added the giving project, made it the grant making body of our largest fund. And so we were trying to figure out, we've traditionally given out um, more than $100,000 through that fund. So even if our giving project reaches its goal, and we hope that they'll reach and exceed their goal every year, what is our commitment to our grantees? Some of whom, to the question that was raised before, like we have been supporting for 10, 15 years. Um, and so we decided to, match what the giving project raised or or more than match it if we have the capacity to do so but we're fundraising every year too so we don't know what that's exactly going to look like so we can't just say oh you put this money in the table we'll be able to to meet you but we, we'll, we'll say we'll, we'll try um and then collectively we'll see how we can resource as many groups as possible through that um and it, i think one of the things that's been so amazing about being part of the learning community is to think about i mean we make a lot of grants to organizations with budgets of ten thousand dollars or less and will give them $3,000 or $5,000. And they may have not made it competitively if we were trying to only give grants to groups of $10,000, and therefore we had to give a smaller number to organizations. But we're able to seed new work because we give smaller grant amounts. I also think there's a lot of value to giving larger grant amounts, and it's one of those things that we're constantly balancing and thinking about. Um, there's, there's certainly trade-offs on either end of that spectrum, but that's where we've landed. And like I said, we end up supporting um, between this year, we supported 50 groups through the uh, seed fund cycle, which is what the giving project is a part of. And we don't do issue focused giving projects, but I think we're really excited to, as we, we committed to a three year pilot, and now we're done with three years. So this is a year of experimentation for us at Crossroads, or, or maybe new innovation with thinking about issue based giving projects, thinking about if, could this be a source of new funding for us? We've talked about funding 501c4 as a group with a more explicit political orientation. Um, and that the Giving Project could be a way to experiment with a whole new group of grantees and, and running that as a separate um, process to, like, instead of having it be part of this existing cycle, or maybe in addition to that. So um, it's one of the great things about being part of this group is to get to see what other people are doing with the model and think about how that could work better or differently for us. Um, I'm having a hard time with this question because we actually, we had some ways in which we, we did it differently the first time around just because similarly, you know, we were kind of overlaying giving project on our existing grant making practices um, that had been around for a long time. And we found that those were the things that were most clunky and didn't work. So we're actually moving closer to the model um, as we move forward um, and just like, swallowing some of that like change fear that folks have and just saying like we want to go in on this and really just try being you know fidelity to the model let's see how it goes um in terms of like the big beats uh, of the giving project and i think if there's any changes that we're making it's more within 
<clears throat> you know, each uh, piece of the curriculum. Um, and I think that you all are doing that as well, but um, you know, one I can think of is um, in the race class training, really thinking about uh, finding data disaggregating at Asian populations, because that's a real big schism in the city of Philadelphia where we have Cambodian and Vietnamese refugee folks, and we have you know wealthy Indian and Chinese populations, and all of the data just looks like um, erases the experiences of um, some of those refugee populations. So we're just trying to be responsive um, as much as possible to folks in the room who are saying like, hey, this doesn't actually reflect what's going on right now. So, um, and that's not, that makes sense that we would need to shift some of that for our locality, basically, um, as well. So I think we're just enjoying um, taking the model and really massaging those uh, individual sessions. Um, yeah, putting our own flair. So I have many questions, but I'm also going to spend the next two days with you guys, as well as um, North Star Fund and Chinook Fund. Um, so I'd love to um, open it up to you all. Um, I think we can get questions from Facebook Live, too, right? Yeah. So let's do that. Great. Um, so, uh, Elaine, so you have some questions for Facebook? Uh, not yet, but... You will, but okay. Um, so, Elaine, you have a question now. Okay, I'm um, just wondering here, we are really tech millennial heavy city, but um, uh, building relationships with, um, you know, social justice philanthropy and the mindset, I think, that people in tech world live in, or I have been there, there are kind of closed circles, I think, within within those industries, and I wonder how well you're doing in um, connecting with them. So the question was about kind of bridging the gap between the social justice philanthropy world and the tech world. Yeah. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Well, I don't have a, a tech world um, sort of piece, but I would say, you know, and again, it really speaks to the, the staff that we have. One of the things that I really appreciated in the model is so intentional about bringing multiple uh, groups of people together and having shared experiences. So, um, you know, we all live in little enclaves of people that are very similar to ourselves. And one of the things that I'm really excited about with this model is that it really breaks that down and brings us together in new ways where, I think that would probably be one of the most common sort of uh, experiences that I hear from participants in the giving project is, I never would have met these people if it wasn't for this. So, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but that's what I would say. Do you have, if you don't, many of your cities have like the concentration of tech um, that Seattle does. Um, do you have sort of corollary industries that you think about strategically? Not that I could think of. I think we're excited to keep learning from you all so you continue to figure it out. Because it, it is just a different a body of folks who have a different relationship to money, I think, a lot of times. So there, the, maybe there's a, a, a money story that maybe, like, I know that Crossroads Fund was started by folks who had inherited wealth um, and people with earned wealth and people who were activists doing the work on the ground, and those all those circles were totally overlapping. And not, not completely separate, but um, moving beyond, like really thinking about folks who, for whom maybe philanthropy, I think there's so much power in the Giving Project model, the fact that it moves, it introduces and makes us all think of ourselves as philanthropists, this word that I think we have this idea in our minds, so about what it looks like, and it isn't always somebody who is coming to new earned resources in a different way. So we, we're seeing that in, in just engaging a younger group of folks through the Giving Project, which has definitely been true for us as well as um, I know that's like an intention behind the model, um, but not in tech specifically, and I'm excited to keep figuring that out. Mm -hmm. That's our week. Right. Yeah, I have a good question um, for um, Arati. 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 Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, you said that you found some data uh, for breaking up a variety of banking groups, which I think is really awesome. How did you go about doing that? What data mining did you do? How did you? 
Sure. So the question was around um, breaking down Asian and Pacific Islander groups, um, disaggregating data. Um, to be very honest with you, uh, we had a connection with the head of the um, uh, student Asian Student Alliance at uh, the University of Pennsylvania, who just had that data <laughs> available. And so it was uh, quick and easy, but I'm happy to share some of that out. Um, we have some really cool slides um, that we're using now that kind of, you know, put things together and bubbles and things I don't know how to do. Um, but <laughs> that really shows show some of that breakdown. Esther. I, um, I'm interested that you all are 30 and 40 year old organizations taking this on. Are you or any places in the region to working trying this with startups? So the other two organizations you heard about, North Star Prime and Chinook Prime. Oh, sorry. The question was: so these, we're all around the same age. We're all in our late thirties, early forties as organizations. <laughs> <laughs> I also am that age as an individual, but <laughs> talking about organizations. So, um, so the question is: are, is there anybody doing replicating the model who is younger? Um, and uh, and so so the the other two that you heard about, Chinook and North Star, are also right around the same age. Um, however, there is, a, I think it's okay to say this, um, I, I, I know that it's okay to say this, um, we have a new uh, group of folks joining us at the convening this year from Detroit. Um, it is not, they are not yet an organization. Um, they're not even a foundation. They're a group of groups. They're a coalition. Um, and they've decided to, they decided to do this. Um, and they got some funding from the Ford Foundation to figure out for themselves what community-based um, philanthropy will look like. Um, for Detroit, and so they're they're just in, like you know, I can say that much, and the, and, I, and I don't think that they have even gone much further than that. They're just in, taking the very first baby steps. Um, so that's really exciting. That's going to be a whole new um, level for us to figure out what this model can look like. Well, what does it look like for a startup? What does it look like when you don't have um, you know 40 years of infrastructure and donors and credibility behind you? Um, we're good. we're about to find out and. Detroit is such an amazing place to find that out, so I can't wait. Yeah. And we've had interest from other places too. Well, there have been, I mean, one of the things, just so you all know, I mean, you guys have something that is um, such an exciting, such an exciting possibility. Every time that uh, people speak about this or hear about this, they're like, okay, where can I get some more information? Mm -hmm. um, so we've had interest in, in people kind of contacting us from really all around the country wanting to learn how they may start this um, or take this forward. So that's part of the intentionality of having a learning community is an accelerant place where we can have learnings happen faster, share amongst each other, and certainly you know, um, kind of bridge off all the great learnings you guys have. Um, and, but also our commitment is to try and support people. We want more and more people to be in this, have it more open and accessible for people, so that's what we're here for. But Allison can't. <laughs> so, <laughs> from the uh, uh, I think you want to um, repeat the question and answer it, and then Allison, you, you want to come in and, and, and pass out now? Yeah, exactly. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, one, one thing that Emily just reminded me yes, the question was how do we go about bringing together a diverse group of, of people into giving projects? Um, we, we had the opportunity in our first giving project to have a group of uh, student consultants from Penn uh, Wharton School um, do kind of an, uh, evalu sort of an evaluation during the first giving project. One of the things they did was to give us an assessment of um, you know, the breakdown of the people who were in the first giving project and, and how representative were they across the city. And they really showed us like what zip codes basically we were hitting and where we were not. And so that's given us some uh, perspective on where we can be reaching out to folks. Um, the other thing I'll say is just, um, you know, we have a big commitment to recruiting from our grantees 
um, and their, their, their constituents. Um, I was just ta talking about this with someone else. We, we do a, a grantee celebration every year, and you know we just had a grantee celebration in June. Um, we had four, 40 grantees, and we had, uh, this is all very new for us, so we're like doing some fun things. So we have our giving project members wear these fancy red sashes that say, uh, I'm a donor organizer, ask me about the giving project. And, <laughs> and so, you know, we have them kind of milling around, um, and it's exciting for them because they get to talk to grantees. It's very informal, it's like a party. And then we have a couple of them come up and, you know, rah rah and talk about their awesome experience. And then this last time I had like a landslide, 20 people signed up um, to find out about the Giving Project. And most of them were from grantee organizations in some way or another. So I, I think that's been a really great and exciting um, you know, next step for us in growing the Giving Project. And then, you know, having that base, having the base as an older organization, we also have many of our kind of original People's Fund members who are still care a lot about the organization but are looking for ways to get re-engaged, as, as Emily mentioned before. And so that's another pool for us. And, and of course, as you all know, now our group and project members are recruiting members for us, um, which I, are, I'm meeting all kinds of people that I would have never met otherwise. So that's really Hey, Allison, do you want to come up and say anything? Okay. You <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I can put some words in your mouth. I, I know that uh, Headwaters does applications. Right. Yes, which Social Justice Fund does not. Okay. Oh, so, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we have uh, an application pool process. Um, I know the other thing that I've been hearing from staff is that the word of mouth has been really one of the best recruiting mechanisms. Again, I think that's consistent with people's experience. Um, certainly what I've also noticed just from my view from afar is that um, people have multiple interactions with it. So they're oftentimes a donor uh, to somebody who was a participant and then it gets them excited. They didn't know anything about Headwaters. So it's kind of a contagious infectious model. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would just say too, I think I know that SGF has done this amazing thing where you've engaged so many people through giving projects that maybe recruitment has to be more intentional here in a lot of ways. Uh, for us, there's so many people who are hungry, and I really do think like your reputation precedes you. Like, we've had repeat members from other giving projects in the last two cohorts, of the, maybe even in all three. Um, we had this year, we put out, we have a very short application. We said, describe yourself in one to two sentences and tell us a little bit of, like, and just, had, we didn't have to do any recruitment beyond putting that form out on our email list and had, I mean, we still sat down with that list of folks and I created a spreadsheet with like so many different columns around identity and, and really just thinking about how do we have a mix of people um, that really is going to create interesting conversations that we so often don't get to have when we're talking about race and class. I think in my experience, I've had those conversations with some subset of and to really bring together that collection is what I think makes it magic. But it's cool to see that just by putting out an email, there's something in this work that people are drawn to and that people, I think, understand and are curious about. And right now, for us, a lot of the recruitment is, is doing itself. Um, and that is a testament to like the experience that people are having because of the model. Yeah. Other questions? Well, I can just say our next giving project will start in January, early next year.
next year. So you have a good several months to think of all your Chicago friends and relatives that you want to get connected, but we would be happy to hear from any of them mm -hmm. in the near future and our, our CrossroadsFund.org and Emily at Crossroads Fund. So um, really excited to connect. Like I said, it's only been amazing to have alumni in the Giving Project cohorts. They bring this trust of the process that I think I think it's many things, and I'm sure I don't know all of them. Oh, yeah, and what, uh, specifically the question was about the fact that our last cohort got gifts from 252 donors, um, and what could we attribute that growth to or that large number. Um, I think a huge part of it was responding to the urgency of the political moment. Uh, the day of our race training of the race and class weekend was the night that the Muslim ban um, came out. So folks were literally leaving the training to go to the airport um, to respond to um, the, what was happening, and then we're site visiting with those groups a month later. So I think the urgency was established immediately of why this work is really vital. Um, it was also a group that didn't have a huge number of meaningful gifts. So I think within that that moment, they were like, "Okay, we are trying to meet our goal. We would like to raise money. That requires us stepping up and fundraising." I think as a staff, we've gotten better at figuring out how to support people. We've gotten better at thinking about how do we track donations and let people see. This is the first time we ever had. We don't use Project Central like you all. We have a lower, we've, we've been trying to figure out how to build up a tech capacity so people can see what other people are raising, and I think that really helped people. I know for a fact there were people who were buying it out for the top number of donor slots, um, and they, were, they would come in and check in with us in a very friendly manner. Um, so so it, it, was, it was amazing and, um, to see, and it just again to think that all those people had a meaningful conversation about what social justice means to them, why giving is important, and that like now they understand the work of Crossroads and the work of our grantees on a deeper level, no matter what the size of that gift was. The fact that it's donor organizing model means that those folks are engaged in a different way. So that was a huge, I mean, that's one of the things that we think is just so amazing about the model is that those conversations are happening and people are getting connected. I can take the last question from Sally, and then, um, and then I'm gonna ask you for some parting thoughts. was when, when we went to this model, well, if people are fundraising for the Giving Project, will they stop giving to Headwaters? And we've actually seen quite the opposite. So, you know, as like every community, the social justice communities are really tight-knit, and so there, there's multiple times that they're being asked from people that they're connected with who are in the Giving Project, and they still continue to give. And so we do um, encourage people to give to like I said, you know, our giving project is one of five different other funds. So to give to Headwaters that we can grant out that money. So we've seen that. I, I think your question is a little bit different about scaling up at a, at a much bigger level, um, which we are just beginning to learn. Can't comment on much more than that. Well, I just want to add that that is part of the point of this collaboration. Right, is right, to right. scale up this model and to have conversations about how we do that and, and that there is uh, money, grant money supporting the collaborative to be able to explore how do we scale it up, how do we let more people know about it, 
Um, you know, what, what does that path forward look like? And there's really smart people who develop the Giving Project, part of that conversation, and then all of us coming in with our two cents. And if you all have five cents to put in, you should do that, you know? <laughs> Um, you all know uh, as much as we do probably <laughs> about giving projects at this point. Like these questions are so awesome, and sometimes in my head I'm just thinking like, well, we've only done two, so give us a minute. You know? <laughs> like we haven't yet exhausted our pool of people who want to do them right now. You know that this this year uh, with the election and and all the things that are going on, we have also seen an outpouring of people who want to do giving projects. So. You know, I'm not thinking too hard about recruitment problems and stuff like that yet either because we're just ready to have people come in and do, do that, that thing. But I, we are, it is on our minds, how do we do this scale? Yeah, I think it's an important question. That's a great segue to the parting question that I wanted to ask you all. Um, so I do want to, it's time for us to, to wrap up. Great. Mm -hmm. Really appreciate um, everybody um, being here for this tonight. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, having this learning community, this collaborative is incredible and does give us the potential to think bigger and scale up and, um, and imagine potential. And so what is your, what's your, you know, your hope, your dream um, for where this model might go next, um, whether it's for your organization or, you know, the next iteration of this model that some other organization might take it um, to? What, what do you imagine? I can talk about what's on my mind. Um, I, you know, just to give you a quick sense, I've been on a, a two month sabbatical from my job. And one of the things I'm doing is actually visiting the social justice foundations and because I've been noticing this really interesting thing about how much it changes the uh, culture of an organization to have this many new people, have this level of deep ownership, and having this transformer of experience. It's actually really profound. And, and I just want to bridge to the earlier part of the meeting today, which is the governance. So for me, philanthropy is, in general, pretty unaccountable as a, as a field, as a sector. Um, it's about money and power, but it's a very unaccountable community. And so for me, this model really helps us rethink about what accountability can be and what about accountability for movements can be. So that's what's been on my mind. I don't know. So that's as much as I got at this late. Yeah, I guess similarly, um, we sometimes talk about the Giving Project as a return to our roots. And Crossroads was started in 1981. It was a similar political moment where there had been huge movement energy and then rising control by the right, crackdown on like folks in organizing, cert direct services. Like, like, I see these parallels in a big way. And folks back then who were coming out of all these movement backgrounds were like setting up an institution that can allow us to move money to folks on the front lines is, is amazing. And let's think about doing that in a way that shifts and shares power. Um, and I think right now, uh, I live in a state where we have a billionaire governor and the the, prom the dominant thought is that we have to run a billionaire against him to in order to win. And that maybe the answer is to just turn things over to rich folks because they're the ones who can fight the money on the right side of things. And really what we know is that the amount of money that we've always moved in the grants that we've given has been tiny in comparison to what could be mounted on the other side and yet with the small amount of resources that are moved to folks on the ground they're able to accomplish amazing things like we passed a reparations ordinance in the city of chicago last year and um, we've been funding work against police torture that's what the reparations ordinance is around for years giving grants of three thousand five thousand dollars to tiny organizations that passed a, a citywide ordinance that's funding the first center for um survivors of police torture that passed meaningful monetary reparations. Like that, to me, the fact that we're bringing back into people's consciousness the idea of moving resources and, and pooling it and, and then sharing power when we do that and that it's not just wealthy folks who have the answer and, and actually telling like wealthy folks that, like giving them an example of what that looks like to share that power together feels really powerful. So that, that feels slightly separate from what you were saying, Nito, but I think getting to be part of um, like, making the road by walking, like not just saying that, but like getting to give people an opportunity to be in like praxis with each other and take action together around that idea is just such an amazing thing and like a huge reason why we believe in the ripples of this work. Yeah, I actually just, to piggyback on what uh, Emily just said, you know, one of the things I've been in my recruitment have been talking about giving projects as mini reparations and as a model 
for us, for more people to experience what reparations could be like, given that we are a multiracial nation with multiple <laughs> forms of tragedy and crime and uh, that all of those stories need to be told and heard and that uh, folks need to be accountable to that, but do it in a way that's community building. And that's what we do in the Giving Project. You all know that, you're experiencing that. And so for me, right, uh, and hearing, you know, knowing about Chicago reparations happening, I and mean, it's, it's exciting to think about our contribution to this larger discussion that I hope gets bigger and bigger in this country around reparations or whatever that looks like um, in the future, and that we have now uh, five, six places around the country, more than that, that are actually trying it out, right? Trying out what it feels like to have real, authentic conversations, speaking uncomfortable truths to each other, listening, and then doing something about it, not just saying, I heard you, but saying, wow, I heard you, and so now I'm gonna step up, right, and take action. And, and that people of color, people who have been part of those strategies can take that power too in doing their own fundraising and you know, building their own communities. And so to me, it's just, I, I think it just has a lot, a lot of growth potential and a, a lot of profound potential in terms of our spiritual growth as a nation. Thank you. That's that's an amazing set of vision. Thank you all so much for sharing that. My parting thought um, uh, for uh, for everybody part of the SJF, SJF community is um, just to know. I just I'm just I want you to know that this is happening, and I want you to know that you're part of it and feel really proud. And I want you to know that um, there's a, a a young person in Philadelphia who's stepping up and realizing for the first time, oh my God, I can be a donor organizer. I can move resources to the movements that I'm passionate about. Or if there is a tiny grassroots organization in Chicago that's getting funded for the first time with funds that, that, that Crossroads might not otherwise have had, that's a ripple effect from you all. Um, and so uh, many thanks to um, our alumni and our donors for making all that possible. And huge, huge thanks um, to our partners, um, as well as uh, these three, also Chinook and North Star, um, for all the work that they're doing, just taking this model to new heights. And again, uh, if you know people in these cities, you should totally get them in touch. And there's the, the email addresses, or just go to their websites. Um, so with that, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Please, uh, some applause for, for our panel.